Good, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us on uh, what's turning out to be a rainy day. Uh, for those who um, I don't know, I'm Sandra Galea. I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of the School of Public Health here. And welcome all to our annual Bicknell Lecture. Uh, before I talk about the Bicknell Lecture, let me um, start by um, thanking all of you for coming and a lot of people who are behind organizing this event. Um, I, I'm not going to name all names, because as with all events, there are always a cast of thousands who make uh, anybody who stands here look good. But I do want to highlight on this particular event, Professor Sophie Godley, who I saw a second ago, I don't see where she is, who's over there sitting in a corner, um, who was really the intellectual architect behind this event, so thank you. Um, this, is, um, this is our annual Bicknell Lecture. It's one of our, um, it's one of our Sentinel school-wide events, and uh, this is uh, named in honor of uh, Professor Bill Bicknell. Many of you here know him, but for those who don't know him, uh, Professor Bicknell was a legendary figure in the life of the school and in the life of public health in Massachusetts, serving in both the academy as well as in the uh, public sector. In our school, he was the founder of um, what was the Center for International Health, became the Global Health Department, and uh, he was uh, uh, famous for a uh, sharp, incisive wit and a provocative uh, mind. So the notion behind the Bicknell Lecture is that we select themes that are provocative, that can uh, generate thought and perhaps generate controversy. And uh, this year's topic, as I said, with uh, Professor Godley's guidance and with input from uh, um, members all over the school is, should the mission of public health be the eradication of poverty? And the idea behind the question is that in public health, we talk quite a bit about the foundational drivers of health, often coming down distilling to this notion of poverty as a obviously highly reductionist, highly simplistic approach to it. but leading us to an inevitable question, well, maybe what we should be doing actually is focusing, putting all our eggs in this particular basket. So the, the point behind the symposium today is to try to ask this question, and it is with that in mind that we have a distinguished economist who spent his whole career thinking about poverty um, speaking about this. The format of today is we're going to have Professor Danzinger who's going to be speaking first. He'll talk about 40, 42 minutes. Um, uh, then uh, we'll take uh, some questions um, from the audience. They're directed at him. And then I will introduce the, our distinguished panelists. They will each speak about uh, 15 minutes. And uh, as a combination, both of reflections on what Professor Danziger has said, as well as tying in the topic to their own work. And then we'll moderate some questions from the audience for the panelists. So having said that, let me move on to introduce Professor Danziger. So Professor Danziger is currently the president of the Russell Sage Foundation. Before that, he was the Henry Meyer Distinguished University Professor of Public Policy at the uh, Ford School of Public Policy at the University of Michigan. I had the great privilege of uh, uh, being at the University of Michigan at the same time as Professor Danziger, where I learned a lot from him, uh, both from talking to him as well as from listening to him uh, talk. He is a distinguished member of the American Academy of Arts and Science, a Galbraith Fellow of the American Academy of Political and Social Science, and has been a Guggenheim Foundation Fellow as well as a Russell Sage Foundation Fellow. He has essentially done everything there is to do of note and of distinction in the academy. Um, most relevant to us here is that uh, he, when he was at the University of Michigan, he directed the National Poverty Center at the University of Michigan, which was then and remains now probably the leading intellectual center concerned with studies around poverty. When I approached uh, Sheldon about uh, doing this keynote, his first comment to me said, well, but I'm not really a public health person. And the, my response was, well, exactly why we want you, because you are someone who has comfortably bridged the worlds of economics and public health throughout your career. And uh, I am tremendously excited to hear Professor Danziger speak. Sheldon. Thanks, Sandro. It's a delight to be here. And um, let me make sure I know the technology. I got it. OK. Um, so I want to talk uh, a little bit about uh, why poverty in the US is so high. Um, and then uh, the panelist will talk more about the public health implications. And to the extent that I have a simple punchline, it's that the conventional view about why poverty is high uh, is an incorrect one. It's one that says government is the problem. And if you just got government out of the way and let the economy operate, um, 
that we wouldn't have a poverty problem. So the Republican candidates say, uh, we don't need poverty programs, we need to get economic growth to four or six percent. And I want to make the case that they are exactly right for the way the economy operated from the end of World War II to 1973. <laughs> so they're exactly right. But it turns out the war on poverty was launched by President Johnson in 1965 because he and his advisors realized that economic growth was necessary. You know, when I sometimes give a talk at business groups, they immediately say, what, you want us to have a recession? Uh, and I'm not talking about that. Economic growth is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Economic growth on its own isn't going to eliminate poverty, particularly in the economy in which we now live. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit. Here's the outline. Uh, I set my own uh, iPhone timer so it will go off. I'll try to keep to 40 minutes because I know uh, in an audience like this people will have questions and I want to hear from the commenters who will add uh, important context that I won't. So we're going to talk about the evolution of the war on poverty, the views, changes in the economy, uh, the changing public views on uh, poverty, and I am an economist by training, although I spent most of my years teaching in a school of public policy, but um, economics is the dismal science, and I'm afraid that I have dismal uh, prospects for reform, other than I would say I'll talk a little bit about we do have good news from the Affordable Care Act, which I'm sure everybody in public health knows more than I, but that's an example showing that a government program can make a difference in the sense that the year after the program goes into effect, the number of people uninsured falls, and it would have fallen even more had all states adopted the Medicaid option. So let me go back to 1964, and when I say uh, that um, uh, the Johnson administration realized that economic growth on its own was not sufficient, you can see the, the bottom line, uh, general prosperity and growth leave untouched many of the roots of human poverty. And the war on poverty has a bad rap, I think in part because President Johnson's legacy was tarnished by uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, I can remember uh, when I told my wife I was uh, in Kenmore Square, she was an undergraduate at Boston University, and she said she remembered pouring out of the dorms into the streets uh, at Kenmore Square when Johnson said he wasn't going to run again. Uh, but I want to I wanna praise uh, the Johnson administration's anti-poverty policies. In fact, now I have my daughters uh, studying to be a historian, and she gets upset when I say something like this because I haven't checked the congressional record closely enough. But almost no president since Johnson has made reducing poverty a high priority. So the Obama administration has done an awful lot, but they really appointed a task force on middle class families because talking about poverty in some ways has become a dirty word. Uh, Mary Jo Bain, a distinguished uh, poverty researcher at the Kennedy School, wrote in a volume I edited called Changing Poverty, Changing Policies about, must be maybe 10 years ago now, that maybe we should think of saying something else because poverty conjures up uh, a negative con connotation uh, that somehow poor people are at fault. Uh, the reason you're poor is you're not taking uh, responsibility. You're not seizing those available opportunities. And I'm going to tell a different story uh, about the failure of the economy, not a failure of the motivation of the poor or of government programs. The other thing that's remarkable about the war on poverty is how much it set out to do in how short a period of time. President Kennedy was assassinated in November, right before Thanksgiving. And by early January, President Johnson gave the State of the Union speech. And this is the years before you could easily change text on your iPad coming into a, a meeting. Um, it's quite remarkable 
the broad set of strategies and how it really has shaped uh, the safety net we have today. And indeed, the growth of the safety net has been a point of political contention for those who don't want government to expand. Uh, some of the uh, goals were uh, old ones, maintain high employment and accelerate economic growth, uh, fight discrimination, and the Johnson administration war on poverty was quite <coughs> emphatic about the need to reduce discrimination in all aspects of uh, society. Uh, improve labor market, expand educational opportunities. Some of the first uh, spending on higher education, Pell, Pell Grants, uh, Head Start, Job Corps, a lot of what we still have today in the safety net uh, was all proposed in one chapter. Uh, assist the aged and disabled, uh, promote adult education and training. So um, at the time, why did they propose this range of policies um, if the economy was growing? Because they were living in an economy in which a rising tide did lift all boats. I said economic growth is necessary, not sufficient. Uh, there was a view that not that the poor were to blame, but they were victims of circumstances beyond their control. They were born in the wrong place to the wrong parents, or they were discriminated against and didn't have the opportunity. Uh, in the labor market and in schools that everybody else had. And uh, the problem of poverty was income. In fact, uh, when I was a postdoc at the University of Wisconsin, Robert Lampman, who was involved on the Council of Economic Advisors that wrote that chapter two report, always used the word, he would say to me, we're talking about income poverty. There are many other types of poverty, lack of political participation. Uh, for example, but uh, the goal was to raise the incomes of the poor and that's why we have a poverty line, however flawed, that's one uh, that has to do with um, raising incomes. Um, the closest we got, this I'd say was the high point of uh, public policy. Um, uh, President Johnson had uh, reported a commission on income maintenance and um, you see this view. Um, poverty is not some personal failing, but the accident of being born to the wrong parents, or the lack of opportunity to become non-poor, or some other circumstance over which individuals have no control. Uh, Robert Solow, the Nobel Prize winning economist from um, MIT, was a member uh, of this commission. Bob is uh, 91, but still comes to the Russell Sage Foundation every year. And I, I showed him this quote. He said, oh, I remember that commission. That was a, a great commission. Uh, Johnson didn't listen to us, but Nixon did. Most people don't know that Daniel Patrick Moynihan uh, got President Nixon to propose a family in, uh, assistance plan, which was basically a universal income supplement financed by the federal government. Well, that's probably the high point in policy, but all these programs and policies were put into place at a time when the economy was as good as it was going to get for a long period of time. Uh, there was uh, optimism about government's ability to solve problems. A Yale professor wrote a book called The Moon in the Ghetto, the argument being if we could send a man to the moon, we surely uh, knew how to solve the problems of the ghetto. And the Johnson administration was willing to spend federal funds to reduce poverty and promote opportunity. And I'll give you just one example. Uh, it's work by some economists, uh, Almond and Che. Uh, Almond's at Columbia and Che's at Brown. And uh, as an example, when Medicare came in, uh, there was a lot of money that was going to go from the federal government to hospitals because there were many elderly at the time who were uninsured. And this Medicare is a remarkable uh, achievement of the Johnson administration. Uh, and Medicaid was an afterthought, so they did both Medicare and Medicaid, although they had no idea Medicaid would be as important as it's become. But if you were a hospital, you could not get Medicare payments if you had a segregated hospital. And most of the hospitals in the South were segregated. So this was a pretty big stick. 
And I'd say these hospitals would not have segregated had not uh, the threat of not getting Medicare money uh, was, was given to them. And Almond and Che have gone back and done very deep archival research in which they have been able to document improvements in infant uh, health outcomes because after a hospital was uh, no longer segregated, African American women could give birth in hospitals and in many places they weren't able to do so. So an unintended effect of Medicare is actually uh, the improvement uh, of infant health. And there's a lot of recent research, uh, some of it within the last five years, I have a citation later in my slide deck from something recently, showing that the introduction of government programs had long-lasting effects on kids because it raised the incomes of the parents. So we've now got very good research by economists on the introduction of food stamps. Follows a very similar methodology to the introduction of uh, Medicare spending and the change from segregated to integrated hospitals. We have research on how the introduction of Head Start programs, uh, Rucker Johnson of the University of California, Berkeley has important work. All of these programs and policies have had lasting effects on the economic and health outcomes of the generation of kids who came through them. And for those of you who are research wonks, in many of these, they're able to use data in which the older child was already beyond Head Start age and didn't go to Head Start, and the younger child went to Head Start. So they're sort of within family fixed effects. Um, so unfortunately, uh, this golden age uh, ended in the early 1970s. 1973 was the first oil embargo. It led to a period of uh, higher, oops, higher unemployment and uh, economic stagnation. Um, and um, um, it's only when we go back that we see uh, how good this period is. Since then, um, these days I don't have to tell people that we live in an era of rising inequality. Peter Gottschalk and I wrote a book called America Unequal in 1995 and Critics said, well, this is only temporary. Yes, inequality's been increasing, but uh, we don't expect this to continue. Um, unfortunately, this is one of those cases where I wish the critics had been right, but in fact, uh, things have gotten even worse than I thought they would in terms of inequality uh, when I was writing in the 1990s. The main issue is that less educated workers and even the median male worker uh, no longer benefit much from economic growth. This is not news these days. You can read it whenever uh, there's a report uh, that comes out from the Census Bureau, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, productivity gains no longer translate into wage gains. Uh, we have increased inequality in earnings, incomes, and wealth. And because I felt I had to do a little background reading for this talk, I'll even show you uh, we have increasing inequality in life expectancy, something probably all of you know, but I just read a new National Academy of Science report on the topic. Uh, while the war on poverty, I want to argue, was very successful, what happened is in the early period, you had a booming economy in which a rising tide lifted all boats, so the economy reduced poverty. And then on top of that, you put in all these government programs which were poverty reducing. So you got a drop in poverty. And what we've really had since 1973 is an economy when it grows, it hardly reduces poverty. And most of the additional poverty reduction has come from government programs. So if you take the advice to get government out of the way, uh, poverty would be even higher. Now, one of the things I spent a lot of time teaching students, it's not very obvious, is the counterfactual. That is what, in other words, critics say, we have spent X trillion dollars on poverty programs and poverty is as high as it was in the 1970s, therefore these programs must be a failure. And I'm saying, well, in the absence of these programs, poverty would have been even higher. You don't see the counterfactual. In fact, in the news yesterday, there was a story 
about the stimulus based on a new research project which said, you know, people said the stimulus failed because the unemployment rate reached 10 percent. And their argument, they've done an analysis, is that in the absence of the stimulus, the unemployment rate would have gone to something like 14 percent. But of course, we never see the counterfactual. It's what academics make their living doing, but um, uh, it's not very um, transparent. And now I'll run quickly through some slides. Oops, that's, see, I'm a techno dummy. Which one of these is the laser, is it? Well, I'll assume I don't know how to use the laser. Uh, what you can see is that in this era when a rising tide lifted all boats, these are uh, male wages of full-time year-round workers. And I pick that group because obviously they're taking responsibility. They're not on welfare. This is the median worker who works full-time year-round. They're not on unemployment insurance. They're not on disability insurance. So that number uh, went up rapidly uh, from around 1960 to the middle of the 1970s. And if you thought the economy was going to continue to have a rising tide lift all boats, you would expect to see for male wages what you see more in the women's line, although women clearly still earn much less than men, even full-time workers, but at least you get a rise between the early years and the later years for men. If the line had grown as sharply, then the median earnings of men would be something like 90,000, and economic growth would have eliminated poverty the way we measure it. So in some sense, it's right. If we had economic growth that trickled down to the median worker and those below, then poverty would be a lot lower. <coughs> what the fact is remarkable is that Inflation-adjusted earnings, I only have 2012 here, but the 2014 numbers just came out, and I didn't um, bother because it's virtually the same. Um, real wages of the median male earner is no different than it was in the early 70s, and that's the story. That's why poverty stays high. <laughs> uh, you can see a little bit of an example about this in terms of inequality. Um, everybody in this room probably uh, has at least a bachelor's degree or an advanced degree. Those are the groups that have had uh, uh, real uh, growth in weekly earnings, less than high school, high school, no college, and some college or an associate's degree, nothing or a loss. This is the story. This is why poverty is high. Um, the part about inequality. Uh, in the old days, uh, the Maytag factory uh, in Maytag, Iowa, had a Maytag um, running it. They lived in the same town. Uh, there was some notion of a balance between what the top made and what workers made. Cummins engine in Indiana, you could go through a lot of the manufacturing towns. Uh, these were uh, important firms, uh, certainly. Uh, it was also a world in which uh, the U.S. didn't have a lot of international competition, so some people argued that uh, the firms had uh, excess profits and, and could share them uh, equally. But you can see this dramatic increase in the ratio of uh, CEOs um, um, to uh, the average worker. and. Uh, is the BU writer here who wrote something about me and BU today, who actually did the fact check? Uh, the exact numbers were in BU today yesterday, but I made sort of a flippant comment about uh, Carly Fiorina. Um, <laughs> and, and the exact numbers, I didn't have them, and she put them in, and I said, have you fact checked these? And she said, yes. It's something like she made $100 million in a very short period, for which most business school professors would say it was a very failed um, uh, presidency of Hewlett Packard. Uh, but, but all told, she had $100 million. The, the exact numbers were in BU today, yesterday. <laughs> So let me briefly show you what it means to say we went from an era in which a rising tide lifted all boats to an era of inequality. 
and this is just, you don't have to look at the numbers, just sort of see patterns. On the left, big bars, all mostly the same. Everybody experienced inflation-adjusted income growth uh, from 47 to 75. That's a rising tide lifts all boats. If anything, the very top, the top 5% in census data, you can't do 1%, had slightly lower, 85%, whereas the median had 99. But these were the good old days. And that's the era that Lots of politicians seem to think if we only get government out of the way, we could go back to those days. Here we have a very nice stepladder. It looks, I guess, for, if this was art, it would be better than on the left. But this is what I mean by slow growth and rising inequality. As you go from the lowest to the highest, the bars get bigger. So it looks like a nice ladder going up, but it actually means that those at the bottom had very little uh, real growth and those at the top uh, had a lot. And so here's my public health bonus slide that I felt I had to put in. Um, this has important implications and this is in a National Academy of Science report for how we think about cutting back on Social Security and Medicare, which there's sort of wide agreement that we have to do something. <laughs> I'll tell you where I am, this is not a talk on that. I think we should raise taxes, uh, uh, particularly on affluent workers, uh, and we can cut benefits, but we could also do that on affluent workers. But the report actually shows that because of these changes in inequality, the popular mantra to raise the retirement age, it's uh, 65, it's 66 for my generation, it's 67 for the students here. People are arguing to raise it even higher and to raise Medicare. That's the worst possible thing because low-income people live for fewer years. And what this shows is basically not much change in life expectancy at the bottom uh, for men, an actual decline for women these are earnings, so the, the leftmost bars for men and women are life expectancy at age 50 for the bottom 20% of the population, so roughly 26 for men from 32 to 28 for women, and then at the top, increasing life expectancy. And so at age 50, the gap used to be for men about five years, the gap is now uh, uh, more than 12 years. For women, the gap used to be four years, it's now 13 years. So dramatic increased inequality of life expectancy. And so when people say, oh, Social Security's in trouble, let's raise the retirement age, that's exactly the wrong thing to do because that falls on the people whose life expectancy uh, is the shortest. Uh, for those of us who have had easy jobs, it's easier being a professor than a construction worker, and our life expectancies are longer, uh, it doesn't matter if Medicare goes from 65 to 67 because we're still working and covered by, uninsur by insurance. But there are very few construction workers at age 65 who can get up on a roof. Uh, and so uh, cutbacks uh, like that, which sound like they're across the board, uh, are actually uh, the worst thing one can do. I'm going to skip ahead. So um, why doesn't anybody believe this story I've told you? Um, some might say, you know, this is the back to the future. There are all these stories about the things that were in the movie about 2015. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that I wouldn't have thought is that in some ways we no longer live in a fact-based fact public policy world. So all these facts I've been talking about and research and statistics and fixed effects, you know, what, and the counterfactual, you know, what's that got to do with anything? But I think uh, it's really that um, the view of the war on poverty uh, was probably an anomaly in American history. And starting in the Reagan administration, maybe the normal view is the one that's emerged, and I think it's, it's the view. 
And in some sense, uh, we're not going to solve the poverty problem as long as this view is a dominant one. It's that the poor lack personal responsibility. They don't take advantage. Their job's out there. They don't want to take them. Government programs exacerbate the problem. Uh, and then an interesting one turns on its head the Robert Lampman saying the war on poverty is about raising income for those at the bottom to let them have a standard of living uh, that is consistent with the rich society in which we live. Uh, a famous uh, uh, quote from uh, Ronald Reagan, which uh, he was in some ways challenging, channeling Charles Murray, who was one of the first to start making this point. Uh, poverty is measured by dependency stopped shrinking and actually began to grow worse. I guess you could say poverty won the war because instead of helping the poor, government programs ruptured the bonds holding poor families together. Um, for those of you who want to read a modern version, Paul Ryan has put out a large report from the House Ways and Means Committee about how to reduce poverty. Uh, in AEI, uh, panel from the 1980s, money alone will not cure poverty. Internalized values are also needed. The most disturbing element among a fraction of the contemporary poor is an inability to seize opportunity even when it is available and while others around them are seizing it. I'm willing to say that there are people who don't want to work, but in a society in which for 50 years, the median male working full-time full year has not had a wage increase. When the minimum wage is lower adjusted for inflation than it was, I also want to say there are people who are working hard who earn low wages and end up poor. The good news these days is we have an earned income tax credit to help them. There are people who want to work. They have jobs but they often don't get 40 hours. This is sort of the unintended byproduct of technological change. I obviously love having my iPhone here, which tells me I've got 11 minutes left. Uh, but firms are using uh, the current IT. Right now, all across the country, people are saying, OK, based on how much we sold at breakfast, we don't need you and you and you for the lunch shift to go home. So there are people who end up poor who are never unemployed. They just get variable hours. And when this was written a lot about in the New York Times, Starbucks said, OK, we're going to stop it. We're not going to do it. But lots of other firms are doing it. So uh, I'm going to talk about technological change briefly. But that's just one example. There are people who want to work. They don't want to get sent home in the middle of the day. Uh, but they do now. Um, so here a set of uh, issues uh, just to reinforce what I've been saying. I just gave an example of technological changes uh, and employer practices. Uh, I think I've said enough of this, but um, um, you know, if I grant you that, I don't know, 5% of people with incomes below $20,000 uh, uh, could earn more if they were willing to take available jobs? Sure, it's sort of like type one errors and type two errors. But the, the biggest things, it's the kind of thing when it turns out somebody on food stamps has won the lottery and then they make big changes in the food stamp program because this person won the lottery and didn't tell food stamps and they assume, oh, all these food stamp recipients are winning the lottery. We've got to do more to check uh, their incomes. Um, I also don't have time to talk about a number of other issues, but I want to put them on the table. There have been uh, poverty increasing and poverty decreasing demographic changes. There are some people who say it's all because of women. I don't have time to talk about that. Why is it all because of women? Uh, because of single mothers. If only these women would get married and you had two earners, poverty uh, would fall. There is some truth to that. The question is, 
if uh, a lot of men are incarcerated or if uh, a lot of men have very low wages, then you don't get out of poverty by marrying. And this argument doesn't uh, emphasize the importance of a set of poverty decreasing demographic changes. In some sense, if women had not gone to work in increasing numbers over the last 40 years, poverty would be even higher. Uh, so women have more education, now more, more education than men. They're working more hours and they're fewer children. And since poverty is based on total family size, all of these changes by women are poverty reducing. So uh, Maria Kinchan, a, a scholar at the University of Wisconsin, uh, has a paper which tries to net out some of these. But you still will hear uh, in the political discourse, oh, poverty's a problem, uh, the men won't work and the women won't marry. And I'm telling a different story. Um, Johnson safety net, I've got numbers before um, the recession. Um, I'll say something about the importance of what the expansion of the safety net did. But this is in some ways the legacy of the Johnson administration that's unappreciated. And it's hard to imagine uh, living in a world without Medicaid or supplemental security income or food stamps. Food stamps now are over 40 million. Um, um, so it's just, uh, for those who say the war on poverty failed, uh, it's, there's just no evidence in fact. Um, again, I went out and did a little research because uh, of the talk today. Here are some of the <coughs> results from a study by Hoynes et al. Hoynes is an economist uh, at uh, Berkeley. And this is the study when food stamps went into effect. This is from looking at kids in the family who had lived in a county in which there was food stamps between uh, when they were in utero and then when they were age five. They know this from longitudinal data. Um, and then they have other siblings who were already older uh, and so didn't. And they have uh, these uh, declines. Um, the term that I did not know metabolic syndrome, everybody here has to know that, but I'm not ahead. So basically it's a paper about metabolic syndrome, but there's also a high school uh, completion effect. Another study, uh, the earned income tax credit is the most important post-war on poverty policy. Um, and uh, it now provides very substantial cash payments uh, uh, to the working poor. Um, and these are the estimated changes uh, from an economic study of what happens when the earned income tax credit was increased, increase in high school enrollment and college enrollment. Um, briefly, uh, on the stimulus, it was the last time I was optimistic, was 2009. As I said, I, as an economist I, and, and somebody who's been studying poverty since the 1970s, there's not a lot um, of um, um, exuberance. You can run around saying, ah, things would be worse uh, without the war on poverty, but that's not, a, that's not a winning, it doesn't get you a lot of headlines. But the reason I was so excited was the stimulus included expansions of a lot of policies that poverty researchers had been advocating. So I gave a talk in 2009, Sandro must do this. Um, the dean wanted me to talk to some donors. So I went out to Grand Rapids, Michigan, where Gerald Ford was from, and there are some rich Republicans out there who give a lot of money to the University of Michigan. I can be snarky now because I'm not at the university. <laughs> um, so you know, they, they bring a few faculty out for a show and tell, and you give a talk, and I was trying to be upbeat. I did search, I thought they're all friends of Gerald Ford, I should look for something Gerald Ford said about the safety net, but I couldn't find anything good. <laughs> so uh, he did once say he wanted to restrict food stamps to the truly needy, but I didn't use that. So anyway, the, it, the stimulus had just come out, and so my talk was the best of times, the worst of times. 
It's obviously the worst of times because unemployment is 10%. We're in this middle of uh, this terrible recession. And then I said, for those of you in the audience, the Dow Jones is $7,000 and I feel your pain. Um, so they, at that time they got into this, the economy's been bad to everybody. Uh, it's the economy. And then I said, oh, look, there are all these things in the stimulus that the Obama administration says they want to ex uh, extend. And of course, they'll be able to extend them. So they increased food stamps. They expanded the earned income tax credit, one, uh, an expansion of the unemployment insurance program, and then one that I particularly like uh, was the uh, something called the TANF Emergency Fund, which basically subsidized states to provide uh, jobs in the public or nonprofit or even private sector. You could go to firms and say, if you hire these unemployed people, we'll pay half their wages for the first six months if you keep them on for another six months. That, so I was all excited. And then, of course, shortly after that, the Republicans said, we're not going to ever pass anything that Obama wants again. And a number of these things uh, went away. But the optimism is, again, this is um, um, the reduction in uh, uninsurance uh, due to uh, Obamacare. And it's obviously a big success. Um, Paul Krugman and others have written about it in the New York Times, and people here know more about this than I do. But in particular, these large effect, larger effects in states that expanded uh, Medicaid. And in some sense, I talked about the erosion of male wages. There's also been an ero erosion of private health insurance. Fewer workers are covered by insurance and pensions today, uh, which is like slow slow growth and declining wages, uh, even if your wages are constant and your employer no longer provides health insurance, uh, your well-being has gone, has gone down. Um, so um, where are we? Well, the good news is after about six and a half years, the unemployment rate is 5%. The bad news is that in the 1990s, it was the last time we really had any economic growth that trickled down to the poor. It did trickle down to the poor in the late 1990s for a few years when the unemployment rate was 4%. So we've got a way to go. And then the economists uh, are concerned, and this is part of the reason the Federal Reserve hasn't increased uh, the interest rate yet, is because some people left the labor force during the uh, recession and haven't come back. Um, and um, um, so the labor force participation rate, which tells us what percent of the population is work, working, tells a more dismal picture than the unemployment rate. I don't see any prospects for wage growth for less educated workers without policy interventions like an increased minimum wage. Uh, income and wealth inequalities are very high and are likely, unlikely to change without policy interventions. And even there, the Obama administration basically accepted the Bush tax cuts for most people. There's some modest changes for people at the very top. Uh, many states are still cutting social programs and public sector jobs. And there's this, um, th I use the term uh, um, consciously, deficit mania in the same way that, you know, there are lots of manias. I'm afraid of spiders uh, and it's irrational. Uh, the Congress is afraid of deficits, and they're irrational. Um, there was very good reason, and there still is, uh, and it's why I'm so dismal about the prospects for reducing poverty. The interest rate is zero. There are people who are unemployed. There are bridges falling down in every congressional district in the country. Okay, stop and take a no, I'll, I'll take two more minutes. I love technology. <laughs> Uh, that was 40 minutes. Sandra said I could have 42. Um, so you wouldn't think there's politics in it. You know, in Ann Arbor, we actually got a very good bridge as part of the stimulus. Um, you can walk to the football game now over this very nice bridge that was falling down before. Um, but there are bridges everywhere, so you would think every congressional district, but there's this mania, no, we can't spend. Uh, we can't... Uh, uh, increase um, 
what economists would call prime the pump, uh, even on infrastructure. So since bridges aren't political, nobody said, you know, that bridge is falling down because it's irresponsible. Uh, if we can't even spend on bridges, I think it's harder to spend on the poor. But what would I do? Uh, so if I think the problem is the economy, the most important thing uh, to confront the people who say those people won't work, well, how do you know they won't work? If you see somebody hanging out on a street corner not working, is it the case that they don't want a job? Or is it the case that there's no employer who will hire them? So it strikes me that to make that distinction, we ought to have some sort of subsidized job program for those who are willing to work uh, and can't find an employer to hire them. And these are categories that, unless the unemployment rate is really low and unless there's a labor shortage, employers aren't lining up to hire the long-term unemployed welfare recipients and those without criminal records. Um, we've done a wonderful job on the earned income tax credit for people with kids. If you have three kids at tax season, if you work the minimum wage and work full time, full year, you get about $5,000. If you're a single person, you get a trivial amount. And so there are proposals out there for childless, low wage workers, raise the minimum wage. That's been in the news a lot. The one I'm really worried about is uh, in the aftermath of the federal welfare reform, uh, there basically is no more cash safety net aid to families with dependent children is now temporary assistance for needy families and virtually nobody gets it anymore. So yes, we, ref we ended welfare as we knew it in 1996. It's a great success if you wanted to end welfare as we knew it. But there are a lot of people who only now get food stamps. There's a new book, $2 a day by Luke Schaefer uh, and uh, Kathy Eden that I would Anybody interested in poverty in America should read about this. $2 a day is the World Bank standard for international poverty, and they estimate, I'm never good with numbers, something like 2% uh, of all kids in the U.S. live below $2 a day, uh, and they have some very compelling stories about it and some, some policies. But there are people in Congress who now say, ah, we need to do for food stamps what we did for welfare because, I don't want to flip back and waste time, but if I remember there were something like 14 million people on welfare then and 25 on food stamps. Now there are 4 million on welfare, but 45 on food stamps. There are too many people on food stamps. Uh, they're lazy. We should make sure they work. And my worry is a work test in food stamps will end food stamps as we know it, and that will be uh, a real disaster. And then the bottom, raise taxes on the rich to pay for policies. Uh, that's never uh, popular when you're talking to donors. So I think I'll stop there and um, Sandra will moderate uh, questions for a few minutes. Um, that was uh, terrific, thank you. So I'd love to get some questions from the audience. Um, while, uh, People are sort of mustering courage to ask the first question. I'm going to uh, ask a question. Um, um, Sheldon, I really enjoyed your talk. You, you make a compelling case for um, why we're going nowhere fast on this. So um, should the mission of public health include the eradication of poverty? <laughs> Put me on the spot, huh? Gee, I never heard that question before. Um, I think um, anything that can be done um, to raise the living standards of those at the bottom um, is um, going to reduce poverty and have the kinds of effects that the recent literature has shown. So um, getting more people signed up for Obamacare, getting more community health centers uh, in neighborhoods, these are very much public health issues. Um, I don't know how um, expanding jobs and raising the minimum wage and expanding the EITC relates to public health. There are clearly um, uh, kids who are eligible for Head Start who are not in Head Start. So uh, when I think of what 
public health can do, then obviously uh, those are the kinds of policies that I think of. It's probably not a very good answer, but. <laughs> Let's take a couple of questions. We have uh, three minutes for questions. Thank you for your talk. In the spirit of. There's a mic coming just so that you can. Um, in the spirit of Dr. Bicknell, um, I'm also wondering, I know you can't maybe comment at length about this, but how our policies have also impoverished people around the world, you know, because we've seen an increase in global poverty and certainly our economic policies affect that, you know, and um, there's a lot of talk of like free trade and so on in the news. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on the current discourse on how our economic policies are infecting the global economy and, and leaving the poor behind. So I'm going to give you a counterintuitive answer. Um, our policies have contributed to the reduction of hundreds of millions of people in poverty. It's not my area, but my understanding is the World Bank puts out numbers and the percentage of the population living below $2 a day has fallen dramatically a large part of which is from China, where people from rural areas who lived on almost nothing have gone to the coast to work in Nike and Apple factories in miserable conditions, but earn more than they earned miserably in the rural areas and are above $2 a day. So some of the effect of globalization that lowers wages in the United States has actually raised wages and reduced poverty in China, in India, and other trading partners. Two, two, two more questions. Over here and over there. Thanks for, for an excellent talk. Um, you didn't mention, it was on your one of your slides, but you didn't mention unions. Um, and uh, it seems, Certainly with rising inequality and stagnating wages, that's been accompanied by tremendous unionization and attacks on labor. On, on labor. I'm sort of not curious about, you know, how important is that? I mean, it's, one, one can argue about that, that for a long time, but one can think of two ideal sort of types of where we want to go. And one ideal type is sort of the Northern European ideal type, where we have, try to get full employment and try to, try to get people to get incomes rising through good jobs. And another ideal type would be we just forget that. We just try to maximize productivity, maximize GDP, tax the heck out of the rich, and redistribute it as income. And so I guess my question is about how important is work and how important is income? Uh, great question, and obviously I'm reminded of Denmark, which has been in the news because it was in uh, the debate. I'll give you my own Denmark story. Uh, before I was president of the Russell Sage Foundation, I was on a review panel for a project that looked at, uh, we had done a, we, the foundation, I wasn't we then, the foundation had done a book on low-wage work in America. And the question was, all of these jobs can't be outsourced, and they're done everywhere else. Uh, hotel maids, checkout clerks at supermarkets, butchers. There were a set of jobs, hospital health aides. Uh, what do other countries do? And so the foundation funded research teams in Denmark, Holland, Germany, England, and France and then did a big comparative study. And my job, I got assigned to be the reviewer of everything Danish. So I got to spend a little time in Denmark. And it's a remarkable country in which, uh, you know, as somebody said, there are only eight million of them. They really worry about the quality of work. And, you know, I was blown away. So I was walking from my uh, hotel to the campus and I looked there are kids in the park with fro coming from daycare, and I, what's, what's wrong with that picture? Why does it look different? It was because they had so many teachers and teacher's aides. Um, on the other hand, the faculty members I talked to wish they were teaching in the U.S. where taxes are lower and they could buy the kind of stuff that faculty members here have. So 
you know, I think that's right. I think when I said these are modest policies, I think everybody uh, realizes Richard Freeman at Harvard has written about this for many years, that I had declining unions are an issue and our laws make it much harder for unions. There are examples of countries, France, where the laws make it too hard to hire people and um, too hard to fire people so they don't hire people. Our laws are too easy to fire people. After all, where did Trump became famous by saying you're fired? Uh, so your point is exactly right. Um, uh, and the issue is when I said these are modest policies, these are basically saying uh, we're going to shore up the bottom, mainly by redistribution, uh, but um, policies that would remake Walmart's labor policies would go a long way. One last question. You touched on, you touched on it briefly, but if you can uh, expound a little bit about how the war on drugs and mass incarceration has impacted poverty in the United States, that would be helpful. Yeah, that's one where I will, I was trying to get back to the slide uh, to get this out, but somebody else will do that. Um, there's good research on that by um, Deva Pager, Bruce Western, Becky Pettit. Some of these are Russell Sage Foundation books. Uh, clearly, um, over-incarceration uh, means that there are fewer people available to be fathers and, and uh, workers in low-income communities, and having a criminal record is much worse than being a high school dropout. So I think... Um, I don't have a quick estimate that says it would change the um, poverty rate from X to Y. I know this book by Becky Pettit shows that, you know, if you count prisoners as unemployed, obviously the number of people unemployed uh, are, are great. This seems to be one area of modest optimism that the New York Times this morning seemed to say lots of police uh, are on board for doing something about this. So we've done this for more than 20 years, almost 30 years. Uh, at least it looks like we will be doing less mass incarceration in the future than, than we have been. So that's clearly an important, uh, an important factor. Please join me in thanking Professor Danziger.